My name is Gabor Gross. I was born in Hungary, the city of Debrecen. I was nine years old in 1944 when the German occupied Hungary. I remember we were in a movie house. We were coming out from the movie and the German airplanes were flying overhead of us and uh, it was very scary. The next morning when we woke up, <coughs> they assembled one airplane of one of the Main Street Park, which was a very famous park because a statue was there from a, a Hungarian hero who was in the 1848 revolution. And when we had to pass through that park, it was very scary to see that aeroplane. And shortly after uh, the Germans occupied Hungary, they ordered we had to put a yellow star of David on our chest and had to wear it all the time. And a couple of weeks, one or two, they designated some section of the city where most of the Jewish people were living. They made a ghetto. They closed the ghetto. Actually, in the city where I was born, we had two ghettos. One was a smaller ghetto, and where we were, it was the larger ghetto. A couple of weeks later, they moved the small ghetto into the larger ghetto. And who did you live in the ghetto with? Pardon me? Who did you live in the ghetto with? When, uh, actually, my, my father was uh, in the First World War and, and got uh, 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 saved, he got into a prisoner of war. Actually, when he, they caught him in a service, he was 17 years old, and he was in prisoner of war, and he went back to Hungary. Uh, he was 24 years old. And while he was fighting on the German side, <clears throat> Uh, he saved the life a high-ranking Hungarian officer. And because of that, uh, this officer gave him his cigarette holder, gold, 14 carat gold. Those days were, uh, that was a thing, a man smoked cigarette, they had a cigarette holder. And he had his uh, the officer name in it and rank, and he gave it to my father, and they gave him some rank. And because he was uh, a very fast-moving person, the Jewish uh, uh, community asked him to measure the apartments, the large ghetto where people were living and they just know how many persons can go in one room. So they planned advance before they moved the small ghetto in to the large ghetto. Anyway, <clears throat> my father, uh, uh, they, before 1943, of 42, they always called him in every year to, 
to the service. Uh, of course, they gave him uh, the Hungarian uniform. Uh, he was in uniform and he was charged over 10 soldiers. And uh, because of his rank. And uh, F they will sure make sure she doesn't forget what he learned previously in the service. After uh, about 42, they caught him in again every day, but they gave him no uh, army uniform. He had to wear his own uniform. And he was the force labor. And after the small ghetto, they moved into the large ghetto. My story is big. You have time? Well, this is the beginning of the, almost the end. Uh, but after they moved the small ghetto in, we had a, an older lady moved into our apartment. By the way, my father owned a small grocery store and he was working uh, there with one or two help and a lot of time my mother went to help in the store. And most of the time when they, my, they called my father in the service for first forced labor, my mother was handling the store. Uh, <clears throat> about in 1944, the ghetto was closed. Uh, we were not allowed to go out from the ghetto. And the last day before they closed the ghetto, my father had to report some place for uh, uh, forced labor. By the way, my mother, before this happened, uh, he found out that he was staying previously. Uh, the general, the army general was uh, very human and my mother write a letter to him and send the gold cigarette case with the officer name inside. And all those people who were there, they put them in train and they were going to the Russian front. And just before the train left the station, they were calling my father name and by the way, his name was Ignaz Gross, and uh, they called his name, and uh, he report, said, get off the train, and everybody who was on that train, nobody returned. Anyway, my father come back, and by the time he come back, because those days the trains were moving very slow, uh, he got another paper to report someplace else. And I remember I said goodbye to him. on the railroad station. Then, in the ghetto, the, the Hungarian army soldiers and the Hungarian special forces, they were very rude, and they went to house to house, apartment to apartment, and they said everybody who has any valuable 
silver, gold, money, everybody has to put outside on a blanket. If after they find anything with somebody, they're going to shut them right, right there. So it was panic. Everybody was scared. This special forces, they call them gender. These were like the state troopers, you know, very tough, very tough. You know, the law said you're not, about, not supposed to hit anybody, but they will carry the rifle with a bayonet in it on the shoulder. And the only thing they had to do is just straight out the strap on the rifle and they hit the man right between the leg. They were very tough. A couple of days later, they told us, everybody take a couple of days, or two, three days food and have a blanket and they're going to move everybody out from the ghetto. Couple of days later, the way they said, they take us to in Debrecen in a brick factory. And who was with you? Pardon me? Who was with you when they took you to the brick factory? My Did mother you? and my brother. I had an older brother. He was a year and a half older than I was. They empty out the ghetto. Everybody was there. And cleaning facility was very limited. Of course, food, they didn't give us any food. The food we had, what we take with us. It was uh, middle of May, I believe, 1944. And uh, shortly after, they jammed us in a cattle wagon. 80, 90 people in one wagon. They locked the door, we couldn't get out. We don't have much room to sit down or anything because we were jammed in. Nature, we had to do inside because they don't let us go out. Well, finally the train moved and they take us to a camp. The name was Strashof. And in Strasthof, they opened the door. In the wagon where we were, there was a man who passed away. And they let us get off the wagon. And we were very tight in the wagon, so we stretched out, sat down in the grass. And first time we get a little fresh air. And we take us with our belonging. And very short time after, the way we were sitting down in a line on the grass, an uh, Austrian farmer come with two trucks and he picked out about 60 people and he take us to his farm. Lucky, he picked us and
is very different. My friends, my classmate, who was sitting next to us on the grass, he didn't pick. Never see them again. All these people who picked, we slept in one barn. They set up a big barn and we slept on, I don't even know how they call it, you know, when the, the hay, when they put them in, in like boxes, you know, for feeding the animals in the winter time. They put those together, those were our beds, and we used our own blankets and pillows that we were allowed to take with us, and we sleep on it. Mostly women, we didn't have too many men. A man who, we had only a couple, they were, uh, they were hurt in the First World War, so they didn't take in to forced labor. So in here, we had to do farm work. Me and my brother helped. We picked potatoes and bring drinking water to the workers. My mother was working a hardware machine she never did that kind of work in her life. She had to feed the machine all day long. She was a strong woman. I happened to see an accident the man who set up the hardware machine, it was a steam-operated machine, and the chimney was, was right under the a high wire, and the steam that was coming out there burned the wire. And the wire broke and this young man was, I remember, a very good looking young man. I remember his name too because he shared or I shared his name. He was 20 years old, very handsome. All the girls who were there, 14, 16, 18, all of them was in love with him because he was very good looking. Nothing happened, you know, because we were so close together, it, uh, nothing could happen. But I'm just mentioning, uh, you know, how young girls are. And the high wire hit his temple on the head and some smoke was coming out there. And a stupid man got the sales bottle, if you, old type of sales bottle, what you spritz, you know, you press, the water comes out, he spritz it in his head, and the smoke was coming out. Terrible. This is nothing to compare later on what we went through. When the farm work was done, they put us in a cattle wagon again, again and they take us to Berlin, Germany, 
and they take us to a place where uh, a German army station was in barracks. And they put us in a barrack which one they used for meetings and entertainment. And uh, they put all of us over there. And the uh, Allied Army or Air Force, they bombed Germany every time in the same time. And two bomb, by the way, we wanted to go to the shelter, what they had for the German soldiers. And by the way, we were sleeping on the floor in the that barrack. They emptied out from the chairs, so, and we were on the floor. Everybody sleep there. And They allowed us to go out. We went out. The guard at the entrance of the bunker he didn't let us in. He said, This bunker is not for Jews. So we went a little further out and uh, the banker had a couple heavy bombs and the barrack where our uh, belongings were because when they signed this, the alarm, you know, the, for the airplanes are coming, a lot of our people our friends stays in the that barrack they didn't move. And that barrack got two bombs. A lot of our friends passed away. The bombs hit them. Or part of the bomb. And after the alarm, we went back to our place. And a lot of people died from the bombing. There was body parts hanging on the trees, heads on the ground, a lot of bodies on the trees and all over the inside of the body parts and everything was bloody and we had to walk through to another barrack to get some food what they gave us until they come and they cleaned up, cleaned up this thing we were there for a couple of days then they put us again in a wagon and they take us to Auschwitz. And we were staying on the station on a track. They pulled us on a side track and they were counting us every hour, less than an hour, how many old, how many sick, how many children are on the train. This went for a day or two, and then they decided they're going to move the train out. And when the train started to move out, a German soldier who was guarding the, guard, the train you know the water content what they carry on the side, the soldiers? He had some black coffee. Not Colombian coffee, you know, that, that kind of... But it's coffee and hot. 
they gave it to us, and he told us, just pray God. They didn't take you in there. That time we didn't know, we didn't know Auschwitz. We never heard about that. We never heard of concentration camp. They take us to a concentration camp. The name was Ravensbrück. We were sleeping in a bank, bunks. It was a three-story high. Most of the people, four people sleep in one. This wasn't a king-size bed, you know. Two and two, head to foot, you know, they sleep and they try to keep themselves warm. This was only women, no men in there, and only a couple children, not too many, less than ten. And every day, rain or shine or snow, we had to go outside and stay up. We had to stand there in line, and they were counting us many, many, many times. Some people died right there. They were not a, they were not strong enough to stand. My mother was one of a kind. We bring her, a, we pack up one of a bag, like a pillowcase, and we put our blankets in there, and she was sitting down there to make sure the God didn't see it. The food what they gave, gave us every day, the same thing, turnip soup. We didn't see the turnip, it was light. A loaf of bread, maybe the one pan size. They cut it up, 24 pieces. One piece was one portion a day. We were starving. My mother managed to sew together a, a small bag and he keep her portion in that bag in case the children cry for hunger. This is very difficult. She could give us This show drop really my mother dropped a lot of weight. But managed every day to take us to the washroom, you know, where they had water. He made us undress. I was nine years old. My brother was eleven and clean our clothes from the box and the eggs. She 
she was trying to hide my brother. Because he was 11 years old. And at night we were lucky. We sleep only three of us in one bed. My mother made one night I sleep next to her. And one night my brother sleep next to her. The other one sleep by the foot. Couple months later, I tell you, at night was terrible. My mother wake every night. I had to go to the bathroom. And I don't know how they did it. The washroom and the bedroom, it was one room. They had no doors, it was an open. I think they pumped back the waist, but this ankle high dirt was every night, water and dirt, terrible. Or people were not able to make it to the toilet. They were too weak. Some people died right there. In the barrack, there was a German SS woman. I remember she was a, a blonde haired woman. She had a black boots, always shiny, very shiny. And there was put together a, like an eight foot table. That's where they sorted out our food the dinner, if you call it that way. And everybody in the barrack had to walk around the barrack front of her. And with the army belt, the white belt, with the buckle, the German buckle, he hit everybody at least one time. And every day she picked somebody from the barrack who she did mislike it. She take it into her office she had in the barrack. She take her in for a private talk. Most, mostly she takes some um, educated person or nice person or good looking people, person and she beat them up. When they come out, they didn't recognize them. Blood all over the face. Blues. They lost their mind and they died in a couple of days. There was no medicine or anything to help. You know, God bless those people. Some 
We had some people who were doctors, doctor women. They know something. And people who had some problem with diary or something, we picked up uh, the burned wood, you know, the black one, small pieces, and we picked them up and we eat that because she said that stopped the diary. You. The people died every day, lots of them, and lots of them, hundreds of them. Christmas time, 1944, they come around and they picked me, they don't know why. My mother didn't know why, I didn't know why. They take away from my mother, she was hysterical. Because anytime they take somebody away, most of the time we never see them again. What happened with me, they were, trying to make a, a show for Christmas, like a chorus, you know, to sing in a chorus with uh, German kids. And the first thing they did, they gave me a good wash and they gave me somebody as clean clothes, you know, the one they took away from somebody who never come back. First they checked me if I can sing. So they find I, I can sing. And I didn't know memory uh, any Hungarian songs. I sing them a Jewish song. But they picked me anyway. And I remember they take us to a big auditorium. They was full with German soldiers and high-ranking officers with their wives and their children, and they made a Christmas party. And we sing them. And they gave me a good dinner. I tried to save some. I put it in my pocket take him back to my mother and my brother. What keep the, our, us alive? Anytime we got something extra, we divided by three ways. End of Christmas, they pack us up. I don't know how much after, maybe a month, or maybe two months, I don't know, maybe less. They take us to another concentration camp, bergen -Berzen.
We had drinking water only every other day. They shut off the water. A lot of people had typhus. In this place we had no bunks. We had to sleep on the floor on hay. My mother got very sick. She couldn't go out any longer. My brother and I we still were able to go out to look for some food outside the barrack, try to go close to the kitchen, find anything in the garbage. And every day they come newcomers. We went to look them up. If we find somebody we know, we find one day one of my cousins who was deported, she lived in another city, not where I, we live. And we ran back to my mother and told her, we find my cousin, Esther. Her name was Esther. She get, gave a portion of bread, gave it to us and told us to take it back to her. time we went back, she was dead. The people died by the hundreds. They put them on the side, on top of each other. They cleaned them up every day. They filled them up every day. Finally, we got liberated in Bergen-Belsen, April 15, 1944, by the English Army. Before that, the last day or two, when we went out to look for some food, we suddenly, we didn't see any German anymore. The last day, we see some Hungarian soldiers. Surprise. Looks like the Germans gave the camp to the Hungarian soldiers. When the English army come in, liberated us, they find a couple soldiers and a couple women soldiers, not too many, only a few. And they made them take the dead people and move them, just like the German did to us. <laughs> the English army was very nice. 
First, they wanted to grab the children. No, no. First, they wanted to get all the sick people because the, the place where the German army was stationed in a brick building, they right away, they empty it out and they made hospitals out of it. And they, the barrack where we were, there was a big, big door to open up like a garage door. And they back up with a red cross truck, small truck, you know, pickup truck, and was trying to get the children. I was trying to hide from them because I didn't want to leave my mother. My mother couldn't walk. They take us to the ambulance. This is very difficult. My mother crawled to the truck and was telling the English officer, Zwei Kinder, Zwei Kinder. <laughs> He didn't speak German, but that was all. Because they see how she was, she couldn't walk. They put me on the truck to, they take us to the, to the emergency hospital. They put us clean sheets, white sheets, we never see for months, months, months. Yeah. My mother, typhus, they give her medication. She had a very bad heart problem, a lot of other things. Why we were in the barracks, she lost a lot of weight. She was maybe 70 pounds, just bone and skin. And they didn't give us food. They gave us jello and jello. And they gave us maybe one slice of uh, white bread, you know, that like cotton for a couple of weeks. We didn't like it, but they did the right thing <laughs> because that the way they saved us. <laughs> because our stomach was used to for food. We were young. My brother and I recuperated very fast. I remember it was in a beautiful early May day. The sun was out. I wanted to go out to get some fresh air. They couldn't get me some children clothes. 
So they give me a white sheet. I put it on me and I start walking barefooted. Then somebody come to me, one of the nurses, and they give me a, a, a woman's shoe, an army shoe, the, the one the women used, not boots, so a little high here shoe. Only the front was leather and the heel. The rest of them was canvas. And I was going outside, the flowers were showing, and breathed the fresh air in. I looked like a ghost. I covered up with the white sheet. I had no clothes on, nothing. And I gotta tell you, that's when I met Eisenhower, not Eisenhower. Montgomery. Montgomery, the head of the English army. I didn't know who he was. I just know he was coming with a, he was coming with a bunch of high-ranking officers. And he gave me a cup of candy. And I told you it was such a beautiful day. I walk a little bit, I kick some stones on the way, you know. I used to play soccer when I was a kid. <laughs> so I went back to the building where we were and there was a bench. And I sat down and I sit there. And when he came back from his tour, he went around, you know, look around what's going on over there. He got a box of candy and from the back, he threw it on me. Because he was asking the, the guys who were there, he had a translator to why you didn't eat the candy I gave you. And I said, I take this back to my mother, my brother. That's why he threw me the whole box. That's the way I met him. After liberation, they transport us to another hospital because my mother was very, very sick and very, very weak condition. And from time to time, they take us to different hospitals. And in 1946, in September, they put me and my brother in a German school. I went to German school with German kids. By that time, I speak very well in German because in Austria, we, we were while we were working uh, to the field to work from the place where we were, uh, there was a lot of kids in our age and we played soccer with them. When they find out we are, my brother and I, we were good in soccer, they like us. By the way, while we were in Austria, they feed us very good. Every day they bring fresh food and people in town, they were very nice. I must tell you that they were nice. We were walking in two and two in a row, you know, going to the field to work. 
and next to us sometime people who Austrian people who went uh, with a bicycle when they get to us they threw down a basket from the back of the bicycle they have some cookies some cakes but we never see otherwise and the fall when the weather started to be cold they even throw us some blankets and they kept going because they were not allowed to talk to us. There was good people too, I must admit. So finally, my mother was strong enough to go back to Hungary. In 1946, in August, we went back to Hungary. And in Hungary, we find my father, who was sick, he was not able to work. And my mother was sick also, she wasn't complete 100%. And I, early age, I went to school. Early age, at 14, I was. I went to work and I went home and I put the money on the table and my mother said, where did you get this money? And I told her, I went to work. I went to a place, you know, like a supermarket or something. I have people with the packages, they give me some change. You know, we had no milk and bread. So my mother told me, if you want to work, you should go to school, you know. But if you want to work, you have to learn a trade. Because if you don't learn a trade, they always going to throw you here and there. You never get a good job. So I went to learn a trade. But my mother told me, you gotta promise something. I said, what? She says, you gotta go to school at night. Thanks God. I went to school. I went like a high tech machine and tech school, I graduated there. In 1956, I escaped from Hungary and I come to the United States. Do you guys want to talk a little quickly about how you meet, how you met, your life? That's his story. That's his story. Quickly and then we'll, and then we'll wrap up about okay. your, your message to students and people First of all, you go back to me now? Yeah. 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 Okay, first of all, I want to apologize because it's very difficult to me to talk about these things. And I get very uh, upset, uh, you know, because I see everything in front of me the way it happened. And uh, for many, many years, I never, never talk about it and even early age we got married you know at the beginning many times I cried in my dream and she had to w wake me up uh, what's the matter you know it's nothing nothing I told her but uh, I had bad dreams and I still have some occasionally you know it's uh, it's uh, something which always be with me. It's unbelievable things what happened. 
And I want to mention, like she said about her new father, I'm lucky enough to meet him. And he was really a very, very good person. And like she said, he couldn't treat her own father better than he did. So that shows she was a young teenager when she met him. And well, anyway, they uh, welcomed me in the family. Tell me, Gabor, what's your message to give to the future about what you've been through? It's a very, very lot of things. Uh, the whole thing is an experience, you know, about my mother, the way my mother uh, raised us, and uh, uh, the way we see the whole thing in early age. We didn't give a hard time to my mother. Uh, we, we had uh, another young uh, couple with us in Ravensbrück. Uh, we were together in Austria also. And in Austria, this, this girl uh, was pregnant and she gave birth in Ravensbrück. But this is the girl whose brother died when the electric wire hit her. And she was there with uh, an ant. The ant had two young boys, one maybe five, the other maybe six, seven. I just, Remember him, the, the younger boy always called, her name was Itza. Itza is like a pussycat in Hungarian. The boy couldn't announce it, so he called him Vica. And he all the time said, Vica, Pishinikel. Okay, it's not Don't belong understand. there. No, he needs to go to say. make a pee, you know? But this wakes up everybody, you know? And, and the voice, what he had, that rings in my ear all the time. You know, it's not uh, comfortable, but it happened. A lot of other things happened and, uh, you know, you can... Uh, bring everything out is uh, very bad. This woman gave birth in Ravensburg. By the way, I said her aunt was with her. One day they take away her aunt and she never come back. They take her away to work. What happened, we don't know, but the two boys get stuck with her. Then she was pregnant, and she gave birth to a little girl. And of course, everybody wanted to help her. She had no milk, no such a thing, you know. It's, uh, she didn't have any food to give uh, milk or anything. So once for a while, they gave us some kind of sweet thing. It's, it's, it was cut like a, a, a square uh, 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 sugar, you know, like, like two sugar square. That's the way it was cut, but it was sweet. You never get any cake or anything. This was sweet. And everybody gave her portions, so give it to the baby, so she put it in her mouth. Of course, she didn't take it because she wouldn't need milk. And she didn't last long, only a couple of days. But she was, in the meantime, stuck with the two boys, both of them small. You know, she has to go on. 
and I, we got se separated when they take us to bergen -Belsen. I never see her again. I don't know what happened. So do you have any last final thoughts about how can people remember that idea of never again for the Holocaust based on what you've said? I don't want them to see so many dead people. I don't want them to know when we were in the barrack and I had to climb out. Uh, I don't the, you know, the, the bunks were built all together, maybe 10 bunks together or maybe more and uh, I had to climb out through people. Some people were dead. I was nine years old. What do you want? I can't cry all the time. We realized that uh, early age is, that didn't help my mother and didn't help us either. If you cry Nobody can help you. Thanks God uh, we survive. And even if not everything, but we can tell things what really happened over there. And I have a sign what the British Army put it out there in a mass grave. It's 10,000 people is in this mass grave. And we have more people this size to make mass grave. It's terrible.